there. Welcome to Hollywood Breakthrough. I'm your host, Danielle Tillis. Hi, this is Danielle Tillis with Hollywood Breakthrough. And today we have a great guest, Danny Menace from No Bull Script Consulting. Hey, Danny, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Tell you, I love the name, No Bull Script Consulting. That is amazing. And I love the logo with the bull. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, originally I got into a little trouble because kind of unbeknownst to me, my original logo was actually the Chicago Bulls bull. I mean, we fixed it up a little bit. So when we redid it, we had to make sure it was not the Chicago Bulls bull. Because wow. uh, I was teaching in Chicago one weekend and everybody was like, um... You realize that's the Chicago Bull, right? I went, oh, no, I did not. Okay, I will change that. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh, wow. I see a little change there with the, with the pin as a as the cross there of the in front of the bull. Still cool, still cool. Yeah. Okay. Just want to talk a little bit. Thank you for coming to the show. The consulting that you're doing right now. Just want to talk a little bit more about one, how you got started and what some of the service you can provide for a lot of the listeners to, you know, use your services and help them do their script to get to a good level or improve their level. Sure. So how long have you been doing this uh, the scripting? The script consulting I've been doing about five and a half years through Noble Script. And I started Noble Script in 2009 and I was doing it freelance for about two years before that with some other companies just on the side. Um, I was a development exec at the time, but development execs don't all get paid what people think they get paid. So a lot of us do, uh, you know, script analysis or script coverage on the side for some extra cash. So script consulting, I've been doing for about seven years total. And again, I was a development exec, which I guess we can talk about. That's kind of how I got into all this. I was an exec before that for a handful of years. So how long were you an exec? Well, I came out to L.A. at the end of 2002 from New York. I had interned out here for a semester during college, which I loved. Uh, I had interned at two studios uh, in TV development over at Columbia TriStar and at Fox in their casting department, feature casting department. And so I came out, I got, you know, my first job as a... I came out to write for TV, but back then, you know, development season was not year-round. It was at a very specific time, and I didn't come out at the right time, so I couldn't get a PA job or anything because nobody was hiring. So I took my the first job that I was offered, uh, which was as an assistant at a film production company, which had a first a Sam Storm Films, which had a, a deal with Screen Gems, and, um, you know, was hired as their assistant and did all of those assistant duties for a year or so and then got promoted and you know three years later was running their development or helping to run their development and you know kind of rose up as their director of development and you know we did made a lot of movies we did six or seven movies in three years which is a lot for a small company and uh yeah and, and so i got into you know uh, development and realized i really enjoyed development it was very creative you had a lot of creative input you got to write enough that it kind of quenched that thirst to write, but you weren't, you know, staring at the blank page all day long, uh, knowing that your whole life and the ability to pay rent was based on your ability to fill that blank page day after day. Mm -hmm. um, so I was there for three years. We made a bunch of movies, and then I went over to Clifford Werber Productions, which did Cinderella Story and Sidney White and Just Add Water uh, as their director of development for a few years as well. Made a few movies. We I had sold I sold a project called Two Oz to United Artists while we were there before the other Oz projects had gotten going. But, um, you know, the, the writer strike hit. It hit us pretty hard. And a couple things that we had set up got put into turnaround and, and undone. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, shortly after that, or during the writer's strike, I want to say, or shortly after, something like that, right around there, uh, I left and um, went to another company for a little while, Eclectic Pictures, which did Love Lace and some other things for a brief time as a development consultant, and then started No Bullscript. Uh, I love development, but it is kind of heartbreaking when you spend 
a year, two years, three years on a project, get it to the, you know, five yard line just to have it blow up in your face and then get destroyed. So I think once that happens a couple of times, you just get, get a little jaded, get a little cynical, tired of playing that game, you know, constantly. And uh, I just, I loved working with younger writers. I worked with a lot of new writers at, at all three of my companies, especially at Clifford's and at Sandstorm. And I really enjoyed that. And I love the notes process and kind of dealing one-on-one with writers. And I love the creative aspects of development and the packaging aspects of development much more than like the contracts and, and that kind of stuff. So since I was already doing some freelance consulting for a couple of other script coverage companies, I decided to create my own and it happened to work. (laughs) <laughs> no, it looks like it's working really well. You also did a quick movie, Just Add Water, you mentioned a little bit. That had Danny DeVito and but Jonah Hill in that as well? Had a lot of people. Had, uh, yeah, Danny, I'm looking at the poster right now. Um, it had uh, Danny DeVito and Dylan Walsh and Justin Long and Jonah Hill and Melissa McCarthy wow. and Anika Nani Rose. And, yeah, it had a, a bunch of people in it. And we did, it was an indie it was a low budget. I think we, we did it for about $750,000. Oh. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we, the writer director knew who was an actor, Hart Bachner. He, he was from Die Hard and The Starter Wife and stuff. And he, you know, it was his script. He was obviously attached to direct. He knew Danny DeVito from previous projects, I guess. So Danny was already uh, attached to the project, as were a few other actors who ended up not doing the project. The original cast is like Woody Harrelson and uh, who else? There are a few people like Woody Harrelson, Jason Lee. There are some people, uh, Heather Graham. There were a bunch of people attached at different times. But Danny was the constant. and Everybody wanted to work with him. Yeah, um, they got financing, you know, off of uh, Danny's name and, and a couple of the other actors that come aboard. And we made it in the uh, in a crap hole <laughs> town in uh in california and um you know out in the desert basically and uh yeah uh, you know it's still on netflix it's still uh you know it's findable it's a cute dark comedy i don't know if cute it's a slightly disturbing dark comedy but it's it's pretty funny and it was one of those luck things jonah hill this was we did it right before super bad came out so he was not famous yet you know he had done accepted Mm-hmm. You know, and he was, yeah, this was like his, I don't know, third movie, I think, something like that. You know, he had, there was a small role and Jonah had been cast and he was like, hey, I think there's a role in this for my roommate. And we were like, you know, the producers <laughs> were like, all right, who's your roommate? And he was like, Justin Long, who happened to be a bigger star at the time than Jonah was and was about to come out in the new Die Hard at the time. So that, it was just kind of a, they wanted to do a small movie together and hang out. And so they did and kind of came together and worked out. And it's still on Netflix. So people can pull that up and take a look at that as well. That's awesome. It was before McCarthy was, you know, famous or really famous either. She was just a a hilarious character actress. So yeah, lucked out. (laughs) (laughs) Now you also contributing to virtual pitch fest and also script magazine. If some people probably heard of that as well. Script Magazine is a website and really learn a lot from as well. Yes, it used to be an actual magazine and then all of the screenwriting magazines went under and uh, now it's an online uh, resource with a lot of you know great columns and information and columnists. And I've been writing for them for quite a while. I was writing for uh, another company, Business of Show, for about four years when I started my company and then stopped um, and uh, and came over to Script Mag. So yeah, fun of articles and good stuff on there. Since you're doing uh, consulting, what are one or two things, or maybe more, that you are hearing from some of these young writers when they're first coming out? What are some of their obstacles and some of their hard trying to get something written? What are some of the key things you are telling them to kind of do? I mean, the biggest thing I, I tell people to do is just to educate yourself. And, you know, if you want this to be a career, you have to treat it like one. And that means knowing the business. It means doing your research. It means reading the trades every day or every other day. It means reading tons of scripts, you know, knowing what else is out there and learning. I mean, there's lots of ways to learn and, you know, classes are great and books are great, but in addition to that, 
you should be reading lots of scripts constantly. You should be watching lots of movies constantly. You should be watching TV, you know, and, and knowing what kind of material is selling and doing well and who the players are and, you know, who's buying what. And it's not hard to do and it doesn't take a long time to do. But if you don't do it, then you're basically writing in a vacuum and that will never help you. So, I mean, that's definitely one thing that I find a lot is writers tend to just want to, you know, write their story in their vacuum, in their room, in the dark. And, you know, maybe not in the dark, that would be silly, but, you know, (laughs) they just want to be in their corner Mm-hmm. and do their thing, and they don't want to do all the other stuff of pitching and querying and researching and networking and all the things that actually get you a career. Because just just writing, even just writing a phenomenal script, is still only like 30% of what you have to do. So I think that's that's maybe one of the main things that I tell new writers. The other thing is always keeping logs in the fire. You know, there's everyone's like, I have one script. I just wrote this script. I've been working on it for 20 years. And I was like, well, you probably should have stopped like 16 years ago and wrote a second one because... <laughs> You know, a a writer with one idea is as good as a a three-legged horse in the derby. You know, it it just it just won't do. Um, It's just not enough. So yeah, I mean, just keep writing, keep coming up with ideas, keep brainstorming, keep networking, get out there. I do tend to think that people should try, if they can, to move to Los Angeles. I get into some trouble when I say that, and there's differing opinions on that. But it's not that you, you don't have to move to L.A. to write. But once you have written, once you have your scripts done, and you're, you know, you really want to get out there and make this a career, that's when you should think about moving here. Because this is, you know, L.A. is where the business is. If I wanted to work on Wall Street in business, I'd have to go to New York, you know, so, which is where I'm from, but (laughs) not Wall Street, so (laughs) not at all. Um, But yeah, I mean, uh, the other thing is just to, just to, you know, pay attention to the craft and get better and not, don't let desperation overcome your common sense. That's probably the, like the second biggest career advice I give is don't let your desperation overcome good judgment and common sense. What do you mean by that? Exactly. Everybody is just so quick to want to submit their project and get it out there. And, oh my God, I need an agent. And I have to make this deadline for this contest because I have to win it. And I have to submit and I have to pitch at this pitch fest because it's the only chance I'm going to get. And, you know, sure, I haven't actually finished writing the script yet, but I have to go and make sure that people love me and want to read my work and it always backfires. I mean, like 10 times out of 10, it will backfire if you are submitting something that just, or pitching something that isn't ready yet. Uh, And because you really only get one chance with most people and most companies, you have to make sure you're ready. And so, uh, you know, I have, I've had clients in the past go, you know, I, I just took out a second mortgage. My kids are going to college. Like, I have to sell this script this year. And I went, well, your kids are going to have to go to community college and you're going to be friggin' homeless because that's <laughs> not going to happen. Uh, you know, I mean, it takes years. So if ever, you know, sometimes, and if it's only your first script, like 99.8% of first scripts, nothing happens with. So if you're... You know, if you're betting your kids' college money on the fact that you're going to be able to sell your first script, boy, they're going to be living with you for a long time. (laughs) Uh, That's true. I I think it's just that there are so many success stories out there that you hear that everybody just thinks, oh, it's easy. I'll I'll write a script, and then I'll just get an agent, and they'll sell it for half a million dollars, and I'll be rich, and that'll be it. And that just doesn't happen. So I think part of my job when I teach or speak or, or, you know, consult is, is kind of just giving the reality of Hollywood and how it works and what to expect and what not to expect, because I I think sometimes that gets cloudy. Right. Now, you're not saying that, you know, they can't learn, you know, because they can learn online, they can go to school, things like that. But you're saying the ultimate goal from your point of view is that it's better, even though you can write anywhere, your point of view is that it's better for you to go ahead and take that voyage out and go to um, LA and be out there to be amongst other writers and be around everything. I mean, it's 
you know, it's kind of a, a quantity game. And, you know, if you're living in the middle of Oklahoma, you know, maybe there are some people who come and speak at the local college or do something and, you know, and you can meet 20 people a year. But if you're here in LA, you can meet 20 people a day. Okay. And eventually, I mean, if you're doing it right and you're a super hustler, I was never like that exactly. But, you know, I mean, you can meet somebody every day here that could be the key to your career. You just never know. And that just can't really be said for most other places. Right. Um, and so, I mean, you can learn from anywhere and I suggest that people do. You can write from anywhere and I suggest that people do. But it's, I mean, if you want to be in TV, if you want to write for TV, there is no other place you can be. Maybe New York City, but you have to be here in L.A. This is where the shows are. This is where the writers' rooms are. Uh, if you want to do film, you know, again, if you can't move here at some point for some period of time, not forever and not, you know, as you start writing your first script, there's, there's no reason to be here for that. But, you know, if you can't move here or intend to move here at some point, you at least need the ability to come here at a moment's notice whenever you're needed. And quite frankly, that can get really expensive. So yeah, it, it's advantageous if you're at that place in your writing where you're truly ready to make that jump and try to really become a professional writer or, you know, get to that next level. Yeah, it's advantageous. It's not completely 100% necessary, but it's advantageous to be here. Talk about mostly now moving to the actual when you're consulting with people, when people are turning in their script, I remember you indicated an email that you're reading about 2,700 pages of a script. What are well, some that, of the, was, that was last week. Last yeah. week. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the things that people are just missing when they're writing? What are some of the key elements? What are some of the things that you're noticing that people are just not getting right? Um, I mean, it depends on what level. I mean, at, at the beginner level, there's there's a million mistakes, and there should be. You're at the beginner level, you know that you you would expect there to be a million mistakes and issues. Uh, usually, it's from the concept itself uh, at, at the beginner level. And I work I work with writers from all levels. I mean, from someone who is thinking about writing their first script to professional writers who are getting produced. I have clients that run the whole gamut. So, you know, at the beginner level, it's usually that the concept is not really a movie. It's, you know, it's just not strong, a strong enough idea at the conceptual level to be a movie. A lot of writers, you know, take the write what you know adage and they do just that. They write their story. And most people's personal stories just are not interesting enough to be movies that millions of other people other than their own family and maybe friends would pay to go see. So, I mean, that's certainly just at a conceptual level, very often their ideas are just not strong enough to be movies. Moving on from that, it's, you know, they don't know how to really create a three-dimensional character or, you know, they haven't discovered their voice yet, which is a, a huge, huge issue. And completely common, especially at the beginner level, you, you would expect it. It takes a long time to find your voice and find your style and your rhythm. And it takes a lot of practice. And, you know, if you haven't been writing all your life, I don't just mean screenwriting, but, you know, if you're not, if you're not just consistently writing throughout your whole life and you decide to pick up a pen at the first time at the age of 45, you know, great, awesome, welcome to the club but it's going to take you quite a while to really find your voice. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's certainly a major issue is it just feels very mechanical or blah on the page. Like there's an idea there, but you're not really sure how to avoid it or bring it out in the best way and really make it pop on the page. You know, as you kind of grow as a writer, it goes from, you know, the issues go from bad dialogue or a bad concept or not enough voice to the more, intricate details of creating character and the more intricate uh, writing of dialogue and, oh, and of course, structure as, as a beginner is a, you know, is a major thing. Making sure that there's conflict and stakes constantly increasing as the story goes on. Making sure your characters have really strong arc and, you know, there's something driving and progressing the story. 
making sure that all of your different storylines have a setup, a build, an execution, and a payoff, which are kind of my four building blocks of all story. Not mine, but I like to use those terms a lot. I didn't create them. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, and then as it really gets better and you get better as a writer, you know, it goes into more, even more intricate things, making sure your transitions are really smooth and making sure you're getting into and out of your scenes at the right time and, you know, making sure your dialogue is, is truly tight and kind of, you know, hitting the beat uh, when it's supposed to and all of those things. I mean, there's so many issues that you find that it would be impossible to kind of list them all. But, you know, over time and having read thousands and thousands of scripts, it just kind of becomes innate. And that's why it's so important for writers to read just as much as they're writing, if not more. So, I mean, those are some of the many uh, issues I find. I mean, besides grammar and punctuation and typos, that's that's editing stuff. I mean, it's highly annoying and you need to know how to do that, but that's the the small, annoying, polishing things you can do later on. It's really about finding a character that everyone or a large portion of the population is going to be able to connect with and making sure they have a goal that is interesting and engaging and, you know, relatable or exciting, depending on what your genre is. And then, you know, giving them things to get in their way and, and having them overcome those things in interesting visual ways. And it's just about making sure you are creating a, a visual, cinematic, compelling story. And probably one of the big issues is writers usually have one or two of those, but often not all three. So those are my three little buzzwords, you know, visual, compelling, and cinematic, you know, and compelling just meaning there's, there's something grabbing you and keeping you going. And visual, obviously, you know, film is a visual medium. If there's nothing visual happening on the screen, there's nothing happening in the story. You know, we have to be able to picture these things, what's occurring on the page on the big screen, and it has to warrant that big screen. And cinematic is, you know, Kind of, kind of the same thing, that it's that it's a movie. You know, there's a lot of stories out there that make for great books, great TV series, great short films, great whatever, but it's not a movie. And so cinematic is just creating those movie moments, those trailer moments, those iconic, you know, cinematic experience moments. And that's not easy to do, but I guess that's why I'm here to help. <laughs> Definitely. And what's the, some of the differences from someone trying to, from TV writing to script writing for a film? What are there some drastic differences that people should be aware of when they are trying to write and pitch? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, there are structural differences and, and some formatting differences depending on what type of show you're writing, you know, whether it's a network show or a, a sitcom or a drama or whatever. But besides the, the obvious structural and, and superficial differences, you know, writing a pilot is different because you have to make it clear in a pilot that you have 65 to 100 more episodes, you know, to go. And that's not easy to do. And that's probably the biggest mistake I find in, in TV pilots uh, that I consult on is it, they could be a really good 30 minutes worth of television or 60 minutes. It could be a really good episode of TV. But if it's not giving us that inkling of where else this world and these characters and the conflict you have set up and, you know, this storyline, where these things can go for another 90 episodes, then it's, then it still needs work because that's what TV is about. So uh, yeah, there's some differences, you know, you still have to have a lot of the same elements, but you know, in TV, it's, it's all about character and setting up that world and making it clear that there's somewhere else to go uh, with these characters and, and storyline more than just two hours worth. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the biggest difference really, but man, TV is the place to be these days. <laughs> you think that's better to be, because you even know there's things like, like you mentioned before, Netflix and things like that, that's kind of not, it's, it's not a big screen, but it's a different type of uh, writing how is that playing in the game now since Netflix, you know, are coming up with different movies and so is uh, Amazon, different these networks are trying to move to these different online based companies. Is there a different yeah, way? I mean, no. Well, I mean, I, I don't know all of Netflix and Amazon's business models, to be honest, but, uh, you know, from what's out there in terms of 
the actual scripts, no. I mean, they're written the same way. Um, you get a little bit more freedom, obviously. But, I mean, the upside is there are so many more avenues and outlets looking for content these days. And, you know, in TV, the writer is king. And in film, they are not. Uh, so how is it affecting? I mean, it's giving writers more opportunities out there. Uh, you know, the difference between film and TV is that in TV, there's, you know, 250 channels, and each one is looking for something different. In film, there's seven studios, and they all want to make the same exact movie. uh uh-huh. So, you know, there's different types of material that you can create for TV that just wouldn't work for film. And, you know, it's okay if, if you want to only write, you know, something that will appear, you know, that will appeal to a smaller but powerful demographic. There's a network for that. You know, chances are, uh, whereas there may not be room for that in the film world because it really is about not pandering, but um, connecting with, I will say, uh, you know, the broadest demographic uh, that you can. And just from looking at your website, you have your website is noblescript.net. Some of the service you provide for some of the um, audience can maybe pick up some things, basic studio notes and you have. What is some of the things that you think might be a good highlight for someone who's just trying to start now or someone who's a beginner writer or been doing it for like 10 years? What would be something they would, definitely benefit from from your some of your services sure you have a number of different services uh you know people can kind of create their own package or pick and choose what might be right for them and and of course what is you know right for their wallet uh my my motto has always been your script should not cost as much as your car you know i don't really (laughs) believe in charging like two thousand dollars for notes i think that's ridiculous but so I, i try to keep it pretty pretty affordable uh and while still, you know, making my landlady happy. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, I, uh, there's, there's some services. I mean, even the basic notes service, uh, you know, is very comprehensive, but some of my favorite services are actually not just the basic or the extensive notes, but I love doing brainstorming sessions with clients, you know, whether they're new writers or writers who have been doing this a while, they have an idea, they have a log line or a synopsis or a first act or something, and they're not really sure if it's working, if they should, if it's a project worth investing their time and, you know, blood, sweat, and tears into, or they don't know how to flesh it out, and they kind of want to go through that brainstorming process to see where this story could go. I love doing that because it's what I did as a development exec. You know, my my bosses and I, a lot of our ideas were self-generated, and we would just sit in a room you know, once a week and go through ideas and see what we could flesh out and and what we could do with them and try to develop them. And that was, you know, that's where the real writing and creating part of development comes in. And I love that. So, you know, I do simple kind of hour long phone consultations with clients. It's cheap. And, uh, and sometimes I find that writers really get a lot out of it uh, and for their story. And, you know, same thing with the phone notes, the phone notes are once you have a script can submit it and we go through it. I say 90 minutes, it usually takes two hours and I have a very hard time cutting people off because if I still have notes to give, you know, I might as well give them to you. What am I going to do with them? You know, so that does sound, um, like, a, that sound like a bargain there. <laughs> yeah, it, it usually is. And I usually kick myself after because I, you know, set aside 90 minutes because that's what it's supposed to be. And then like three hours later, I'm still on the call and I'm like, um, this is a bad idea, <laughs> but no, I bet my writers, you know, my clients love it. And we get to actually go through the script a page by page and, and go through what, you know, what needs changing and, and how to do that. And, you know, the services really range from brainstorming an idea that you haven't even written yet through, you know, uh, given notes on a completed script or a completed umpteenth draft of a script uh, to polishing services and, and query letter services. If the, you know, the script is, is really ready to go out. And, and of course, you know, I have my Noble Hollywood Connection program, which is free. There's no extra charge for it. But if something actually gets a recommend from me and it really is ready to go out, and I'm not easy on scripts, clearly, as the name, you know, as the company name dictates, but uh, <laughs> if something's really ready to go out and it deserves to be seen, I send it out to a bunch of my contacts for free and who have agreed to read it so they're not unsolicited and rejected. 
I send them a personal email, and if I think it's something they might like, they'll they'll read it. And we've, you know, I've had some clients score some meetings and and things all over town from that. And so I I try to do that. It doesn't happen too often that something really is ready to go out, but uh, when it does, I I'd love to get it out there. So yeah, I mean, there's there's polishing services which are again for projects that. I've already gone through notes. They really are ready or close to ready. They just need a little bit of professional polishing, um, not massive story fixes and things. But there's a number of services at all different um, price points and points of readiness in your in your story and your writing abilities. And if you don't see a package that works for you, I can usually create one. That's the beauty of being a one-man show. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's two things you made a good point is that they can pick and choose what they like. And two, like you said, if, if it's ready to go, you're actually going to provide a service that most people probably don't do is that you're just going to send it out to your contacts and say, hey, you know what? There's no charge for you. This is a script that I like myself and I'm going to send it out to my friend, my contact. So now you got a, someone can actually are networking with you. Basically, that handshake to you is basically a handshake to a Hollywood executive or something that can actually get the script done. So that's a really great service that you're providing. Like you said, it doesn't happen all the time, but if the script's ready to go, that's amazing that you actually offer that without any extra cost. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, you know, if my clients succeed, then I succeed. So I'm happy to certainly it's in all of our best interests to try to make that happen. But, you know, I'm pretty hard on my script because right. it's, my, it's my reputation. Right. Uh, you know, you send out crap or too much crap and people will not want to read what you have to send out anymore. So, yeah, I mean, just getting a consider or just being a good script is not good enough. It's It's got to be great. I think what you have right now coming up, your four-week online course, Create More Compelling Castable Characters, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. It's a four-week yeah. online course. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, um, I tried to do it earlier in the year, but... Uh, family emergency made me kind of cancel the class last minute, which sucked. So I'm glad that I finally got to run it again um, this fall. It starts September 26th. It's a, a four-week course online, so you can take it from anywhere at your convenience in your pajamas. We love that. And we it's love that. Be, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, me too. Because um, <laughs> I guarantee you, I will not be in a suit and tie teaching this class. So let me tell you. Um, but it's, it's four weeks. Every Friday, we're going to do a live webinar um, where I'm going to bring in a special industry guest. We've got some writers and managers and, and people going to come in, at, come in, come on and, uh, and do some Q&A live. And then we'll have an actual class. And really, this is to create stronger characters, three-dimensional, sellable, castable characters that jump off the page. And because... Characters are what people connect to. It's the reason people keep reading. You know, like I said, I had 20... I, it was not a normal week, by the way. That's not how much I read every week because I would kill myself. But wow, okay. <laughs> I had to read 2,700 pages last week between... I had a, a book client. Um, I had two client scripts. And I had 21 scripts for a contest that I had to read in a week. That I think it might be a record for me. But the thing that keeps you know, kept me going was characters that I just wanted to find out what happened to them. And their stories and their arcs and their journeys are just, you know, they jump out. And if you have, you know, if you can combine, you know, different archetypes and, and character traits to really create an original character um, with a strong goal and a strong motivation and an, and an inner kind of deeper want and need and all of those things that with a, you know, on a flaw and a secret and a lot of stuff that I'll be going through in the class, the kind of the 12 elements of a great elevated character. That's kind of what it's for. That's what will keep agents and executives reading and engrossed. And that's what's going to bring your story to life is making sure you're bringing your story out in the strongest way through your characters and that you have the right characters telling your story. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's four week webinars with Q and a, and we'll have some other goodies I'm sure. And there's uh, there's two different price points. So there's just the class, which is just one ninety nine, And then there's, a bonus package where you get a free consultation with me. You get another webinar that I have done that's already recorded for free on pitching. And we got some other goodies and, and little treats that I'm working on 
getting. This counts for other things that I'll be able to offer as well. So, and that's two forty nine. So the difference is fifty bucks, but even just the con the consult with me is normally seventy five. So you're already getting your money's worth, as they say. But <laughs> yeah, that's um, it's available now. The registration is open. People can go to Compelling Characters dot eventbrite dot com www.compellingcharacters.eventbrite.com and they can uh, check it out and all the details of the class and registration is there and uh, yeah there's some there's some discount codes floating out there somewhere as well on, on social media so you might be able to get 10% off uh, if you can find it out there on social media there's a couple of them um, okay. so that's available too Fantastic. Um, and of course, if you if you happen to follow me on Twitter at Danny Manis, you will eventually see one of those codes out there. Um, but yeah, I highly suggest it. It's going to be a fun class. And uh, so I hope people, even more people sign up. Can you give us one tidbit that's going to be in there? That's just one little thing that we can like, oh, okay. What's, what's the one little sneak peek we can get from the class? Sneak, um, well, we're going to go through small. a lot of different character, a bunch of different character exercises that will help kind of flesh out and, and help you get to know your character better. But one of my favorite exercises that um, that I've been teaching in my classes, you know, the last couple of years, uh, is to find your character's deal breaker, which is you kind of list five deal breakers, you know, three to five deal breakers, the things that your characters would just never do. Uh, and the example I always use is, you know, if your character is a soldier their deal breaker would be they would never leave a man behind, you know, but then you choose one of those deal breakers and you break it. And that's usually what leads to the moral dilemma and the kind of climax of your movie, you know, in order to save the world, that soldier, guess what he's going to have to do? He's going to have to leave a man behind. Mm -hmm. And so if you kind of know your character's deal breakers, it's a great way to be able to plot out where the story could go and how you're going to bring the internal and external and, you know, conflicts and moral dilemma together in that big climax or, you know, at least in your third act at some point. And so, yeah, it's a great little, a great little tool to use. And so that's one, one good exercise. And we're going to go through a number of them throughout the class, throughout the course, but that's always a good one that, um, you know, I said it at a conference like two years ago uh, when I started teaching it and I had a, it was a panel on characters and I had, you know, two very well-known writers on the panel and they both came up after me afterwards and said, I'm totally using that. I have not heard <laughs> that, you know, put it that way before. And I really like that. I'm going to use it. I said, what do you do? Tell your friends. <laughs> uh, so I like that one. And, and there's, you know, about... 10 or 12 other exercises we're going to go through as well. And we're going to go through antagonists. We're going to go through supporting characters, heroes, female, you know, writing great female characters and a whole bunch more. So I hope people come out and join us. That sounds or, cool. Or, you know, turn on their computer and join us. <laughs> it sounds great. What are some of the trends right now this year that you that you see, like, on either TV or in film? What are some, like, some of the top trends of that people are kind of, like, they're looking for? In writing right now. Um, I mean, in film, I mean, the glory of, of TV is there are a lot of different things selling. It just depends on your network and your demographic. But, you know, in film, it's been pretty consistent lately. Um, you know, uh, low budget horror is still doing very well. They're always going to um, do well no matter what. Low budget. Yeah, horror, it, it there was a little lull there, but yeah, they've they've come back roaring the last you know five, six, seven, eight years. What else is there? You know, thrillers are always good. Sci-fi and sci-fi action is really strong right now. R-rated, you know, adult comedy is very strong right now. Less so on the romantic comedy front. Less so on the drama front. I mean, animation is always strong, but you really can't break in with animation. So I wouldn't try. Yeah, I mean, action, you know, there, every once in a while, you know, good mid-budget action. Mid-budget is really hard to do right now, but <laughs> unless it stars Liam Neeson. Like, those are the only mid-budget action movies that seem to be getting made. But, you know, Expendables didn't help since it did not do very well. But, uh, yeah, I mean, 
the big budget stuff is still selling, but it's very hard for a new writer to break in with that. So, you know, but you got to write with the, you know, with whatever story is in you to write. And then if it's not selling, you put it in the drawer and write something else. But yeah, I mean, comedy, you can't go wrong with comedy, horror, and thriller. You just usually can't. But yeah, there's definitely some things not selling. Dramas are really hard. Romantic comedy is really hard. Teen movies are really hard right now. So it's, it's not that you can't write that. It's just going to be a, a bigger uphill battle. Teen movies, is it because there's just because of the Hunger Games, things like that was just overwhelming? To, like Twilight was just so much in the market that it kind of turned people yeah. off doing it now? Well, I mean, that... It's not that it was a, a turnoff, it just, it changed. Like from, you know, the early 2000s to, you know, the last five, six years, the definition of what a teen movie is kind of changed. Like it, you know, when I was growing up, it was, you know, She's All That and, you know, those types of movies and 10 Things I Hate About You and American Pie and, right. and things like that. Now, now, you know, what brings out the teens is, is much bigger fair. It's not the small high school comedy anymore it's, it's not even the you know the sex comedy anymore because they've just been done to death so you know there's got to be a real a bigger world they want a different world they want a stronger hook and i think the hard part about teen movies is teens aren't going to the movies the way they used to i mean i didn't i mean, growing up and even i mean the first 30 years i was on this planet like that's all teenagers did every weekend is we went to the movies and now they don't do that so it's it's a, just a different world out there, which is is weird because yes, studios are programming for the 16 year old boy, but you know that's why they make superhero movies. They'll turn out for that, right. but they don't turn out for the you know the 10 million dollar teen movie anymore. It, it just doesn't make, really exist much at the moment, which is too bad. I you know my company did a couple of them, <laughs> um, and I personally really like them, but yeah. It's, they're harder sells. It, it, the teen movies have just become something else, and most teen movies these days are based on best-selling books. I see that now. So that's the other trend, by the way, is go write the book, because you'll have a way easier time you know, getting a book published than you will getting a film made, and chances are, and if the book does well, getting the film made will be that much easier. So you so. do think that's a better way? Someone should write a book instead, like be a writer and be an author and write a book, and then hopefully someone might pick that book up thinking this might be interesting. Uh, yeah, it's definitely one way to do it. I mean, books are still really, really hot these days. You know, if you were, if you're thinking of writing a hundred and fifty million dollar, you know, teen sci-fi action movie, you better write the book first because that's the only way it's getting made. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely one way to do it. And there's, you know, there's a lot more books published every year than movies made so yeah it can't hurt it may take a little bit longer but it can't hurt what about you know people who are on youtube a lot you know there's web shows yeah. things like that uh, people actually have you know are writers <laughs> going to youtube well how how is that a little bit different and how is that market there is no market i mean that's the problem is no one has found a way to monetize it yet and yet it is what is killing hollywood it's a, a big part of it is that you know, the, the 10 to 18 demographic right now can name more YouTube stars than movie stars. And that is killing the movie business because the people in the movie business, can I curse or not so much? Oh, you can. It's okay. <laughs> okay. People in the movie business don't give a sh about YouTube stars. We don't know that they exist. We know that they exist. I couldn't tell you one of their names and I don't want to know one of their names. Like, it's not something I'm interested in. But, you know, I'm not really the demographic anymore. Technically, I am still within the 18 to 34 demographic. Right, right, right. Um, for a very short <laughs> period of time. And you're, but, you're a male, um, so people still are writing for men. I mean, it's very rare you see films that's catered towards women, you know, so that yeah, it's, you're still it's the demographic starting, people are looking for. Yeah, it's, it's starting to change, and that's a whole other thing. I could probably do another hour on that, but... Um, yeah, I mean, I think YouTube is, you know, once they find a way to truly monetize it, it will completely take over. I, I mean, unfortunately, I'm not looking forward to that day. But, uh, you know, I don't know, one of the dancing, the upcoming season of Dancing with the Stars, one of the, one of the stars is a YouTube personality. And my thought is, when the dancers are more famous than the stars, 
it's time to shut it down <laughs> because it's really, it's, you know, what's the point? Uh, and I don't, I don't get it, but there was a huge article done about YouTube stars, you know, in the trades a couple weeks, a few weeks ago and about how many followers they have and how much more popular they are than movie stars. You know, kids today can name, you know, 10 movie stars. They can name 30 YouTube stars. So, yeah, it's just a different world. And But there, there is no web series currently making money. You know, there, however, I will say it's a pretty sad state of affairs when YouTube stars who have 20 million subscribers are making more money than most of the actors on television. That is a wow. horrible, sad, pathetic fact. They're getting the money from the advertising on YouTube. They're making money from the advertising and all that stuff. There are more millionaires on YouTube, you know, than there are as just, you know, most uh, basic players on, on TV series. I mean, it's so ridiculous. And it's, I don't know. I, I'm not going to get on my soapbox about what it's doing to society. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's something Hollywood is definitely thinking about and worried about and wondering how it can monetize it but it hasn't really been done yet. And there aren't any YouTube personalities that, you know, people are making movies about really yet, but it'll happen. I mean, I guarantee it'll happen. And it'll be aired on YouTube. (laughs) Yeah. We'll just have to wait and see, but I'm not looking forward to that day. I'll I'll tell you. (laughs) What do you think about, and they say, and I don't really agree with this, but they're saying that writers are into, uh, Reality TV. How how is that playing in the factor of Hollywood and TV? Because that's a, a huge trend. Uh, reality shows, things like that. Yeah, but every reality show is scripted. Right. So every reality show has a writer. Every reality show, sometimes that writing is done in post production. You know, but every reality show has story producers, and what they do is they produce the stories you see on the reality shows. So. You know, I think people were really worried about reality TV, but it's not going anywhere. I love it, um, personally. Uh, but uh, the, I don't think writers have a problem with it anymore because they're being hired to write the shows. I mean, they're just not, it's just not set. Half the reality shows out there are completely scripted. It's so. a little much sometimes. Sometimes you want a actual show you know, something you can laugh at or something you can cry with or something, you can, a drama. You, you, sometimes too much of a reality show is too much. And you just, I yeah, feel I'm missing, I'm missing an actor. I'm missing, you know, I'm missing something, you know, and I don't want to always go to a TV show or watch someone's yelling or fighting on television, but that's not entertaining enough for me. I like to be lost in a great film or lost in a great TV show for 20 minutes or so. And just laugh my butt off or something. I can't get that from a reality show as much. And I I miss that portion of it where it seems like the networks has really gone ho on a lot of reality shows and not really enough kind of making a balance. Well, I mean, it depends on the network. I mean, I think most of the major networks, it's not that they're moving away from reality, but they have their, you know, the reality shows that work the competition shows, the singing competition shows, the dancing competition shows, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, some, there's a couple dating shows or a couple game shows. All of the, all of the reality shows on, that do well on basic networks are ones that have been around forever. You know, I mean, Survivor is still kicking. It's been 18 years, 15, 16 years. Wow, I forgot. Um, That's a long time. I forgot how long You know, I mean, American Idol it's gone down certainly, but it's still kicking. That was, you know, that came on while I was in college. Uh, And so, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there aren't too many new reality shows on basic network on major network TV that have done well enough to stick around, but that's why there's so many cable outlets and cable networks. That's where reality is going. And that's fine. I mean, unfortunately the networks are just not doing a good enough job or, or giving their shows enough of a chance to connect with an audience. And so it's reality TV honestly is not impacting scripted TV in any way anymore. It, it was for the first, you know, handful of years, but then people realized <laughs> how to work around it and, and how to make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, for them. But what's killing network TV 
is just the business network business of, oh, something isn't working for three episodes, so we have to pull it instead of giving it a shot. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what's killing network TV. But, yeah, I mean, personally, I like reality TV. It's not going anywhere. Um, it's just becoming more scripted. So eventually it will be... <laughs> it's not going to take over scripted TV, but that's something uh, you're probably going to have to get used to. <laughs> that's true. I mean, yeah, I mean, I do like some reality shows. It just sometimes I do miss a little bit of a scripted show. I mean, if there's tons of great scripted shows out there. Um, and whenever somebody says, oh, there's nothing on TV, I want to punch them upside the head. <laughs> like, there's a lot on television. The second or third, maybe, golden age of TV right now. If you can't find something great on TV or on Netflix or on demand or on cable, you're just not looking hard enough. I mean, there are dozens of fantastic shows on TV for every demographic. So I, I totally, I very much reject people who say there's nothing good on anymore. No, you're out of your mind. There's a million good shows out there, maybe not a million, but there's enough good shows that you could fill up a TV slate, you know, with them. And I, I've got, even this summer, there have been some great shows on this summer. So I don't know. I think the best material is being done on TV. I think there's plenty of it out there. I think there's plenty of room for both reality and scripted. Uh, we just need the network to, and they're starting to, kind of change their business models on how they treat their TV shows. But we'll have to see what happens. I always look forward to the new fall network. I'm a TV whore. I mean, I love it. I watch everything. So the new TV network, the two new TV, you know, fall preview season and stuff is it's like Christmas. <laughs> what, what was your top five shows this year that you loved? Oh, God. I... You can only even find it. It's like impossible for me to, to answer. I mean, I watched so much. I mean, I know what I really loved this summer, um, which is sometimes easier than the whole season because I really watch everything. I, I give everything a shot. I, I, I watch everything on every network except the CW because it's not really my thing. But um, <laughs> I mean, this summer, I loved The Last Ship. I am still watching at the end of Masters of Sex on Showtime. Great show, great show. I, yeah, I have been hot and cold on The Leftovers, but uh, the ending was pretty cool. God, what else? Um, You're the Worst on FX is my new favorite comedy. There has been so much that I have been watching, and a lot of reality TV, uh, but uh, there's something else that I really, really like, Summer, and I'm, I'm totally blanking on it. Um, but there's been a lot of a lot of, oh, Murder in the First on TNT was good. Right, right. Major Crimes is always fun. Like, there's a bunch of good stuff out there, you know, to, to find. So. And I was a little surprised, uh, I'm going to tell people. Uh, you know, I wasn't, I kind of fell into a little bit down uh, downtown Abbey. Uh, I'm surprised. I started watching that. I actually liked that. I mean, it was kind of a fluke, but I, I kind of liked a little bit of that, that period. I, I haven't watched Abbey. It's, you know, my... It's my my dirty secret is I don't like period television. I, I don't, don't either. enjoy it. I don't either. Um, but I, I kind of fell for it. Kind of they kind of suck me in a little bit. I mean that's what good TV does. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean there's there's just so much on TV. I, I know we're talking about TV. Um, the question be, but um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot. Uh, go find something to watch. It's what inspires me. I love good television. So I don't know. That personally, I I'd rather watch four hours of TV than two movies. But that that's me, generally. Depends on the movie, depends on the show. But if I'm going to spend like four hours of my time, chances are it's going to be on TV. Um, but I do love me some film. I just wish there was more good movies to see. And that's um, where we get some, or hopefully someone listening can start writing a really good script for television, a really great script for a film. Because with your classes that you, you can take with um, exactly. the four-week online course, I think is going to be a great insight for someone to, you know, to one, get more insight about their own script, get some key elements, learn a lot. And like you said, you're going to have some, some surprises for people to um, definitely get into. So yeah. I definitely want, I'm glad you're also going to be touring. You're going to be at the Austin Film Festival in October. Is that correct? 
Yeah, I wouldn't call it touring. That that's a that would be a fancy word. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I will be speaking at the um, and doing some panels uh, and judging the pitch competition again at Austin Film Fest. I did it last year and it was a ton of fun. Um, I do. I mean, I speak all over the country. So if anybody has a screenwriting group or a, or a writers group or a conference, writers conference, uh, even book conferences, I, I've been teaching at a lot. So if anybody knows of any that are looking for speakers, please let me know and contact me. But uh, yeah, I'm starting to firm up all my dates and conferences and things for next year. And uh, I think Austin, of course, in October this this year is, is the last one of the year. So uh, after that, it's, uh, it gets a little bit quiet until until Sundance. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Austin is a wonderful event. I highly suggest writers check it out. Go there. It is a a, a drunken educational good time, um, uh, but it's it's a lot of fun. Totally worth it. And also the four week online course is going to start September the 26th. We definitely want people yeah. to get online and make sure they actually go out there and to purchase. Your website again is www.nobullscript.net. We got Danny Menace with uh, No Bull Script Consulting. I want to say, hey, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're going to definitely plug definitely the events and also have those links on our website to make sure people are knowing about it. But I want to say thank you again, the consulting company. Your website again is www.nobullscript.net. Making sure that people are able to learn and, and be able to benefit from your knowledge is a great service and service to other people. So that's a great thing you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. This has been fun.